In this video, we're going to revisit a topic that I last covered, I think about eight years ago, way before we had high definition cameras and uh, fancy editing techniques that we have now. And that is that of bleeding, uh, how to manage an intraoperative bleed. Uh, and it's just as applicable for managing a postoperative bleed uh, should one show up in your office after a, an extraction of a tooth. The patient we're going to look at is a 16-year-old female, and for the last three months or so, she's had um, intermittent recurrent pain associated with tooth number 17. Uh, it's become more frequent and uh, more uncomfortable in the last couple weeks, and so she uh, now presents for, uh, for removal of her four wisdom teeth on referral from her general dentist. Uh, also, she finished orthodontics about a year ago, so she's anxious to um, get her wisdom teeth out so that her uh, teeth don't start shifting, which, you know, it's controversial whether or not that actually happens due to third molar pressure. So let's take a look at her radiograph. And you can see here uh, in our panoramic that the two upper third molars are both partial bony impactions, uh, partially covered by bone. And uh, the number one, the right side, is a mesioangular impaction, which is not as common. Uh, as what we see on the left, which is more of a vertical impaction of tooth number 16. Looking at her lower thirds, uh, these would both be ca categorized as uh, full bony impactions. You can see the halo of bone completely circling them. And on clinical exam, there was a little bit of inflammation when I probed in the number 17 area or distal to number 18. Okay, so to get her ready for surgery, we're going to give her a prescription for chlorhexidine oral rinse to be used twice a day, starting two days before surgery, and then start it up the day after surgery, continued uh, until the bottle's all gone, which will be about two weeks if uh, they follow the instructions on the bottle. Also, because she wanted to go to sleep for the surgery, she uh, came in NPO after midnight the night before. Okay, let's go back and look at the radiograph again. And you can see that we have two upper partial bony impactions. And of course, what we worry about with these teeth is the location and the proximity of the maxillary sinus. And in the mandible, uh, the anatomical structure we're most concerned about is the mandibular nerve. And these are full bony impactions with only about 10% root formation. So the, the uh, teeth aren't too close to the mandibular nerve. But let's look at number 17 in more detail because that's the tooth that is the subject of this video. Let's first map out the inferior alveolar nerve as it goes through the mandible and note its proximity to this tooth. And as you can see, uh, there's about a couple millimeter space between the uh, tooth itself, the apex of the developing tooth, and the mandibular nerve. This tooth has very minimal root formation, and so uh, when we make our split on the tooth, uh, where we split it mesiodistally, we want to be sure to only go down about two-thirds of the way down the length of the crown and not go beyond that because of the nerve position. Our surgical plan is going to be to use our handpiece to remove the bone that is overlying this tooth followed by sectioning the tooth with a handpiece. Remember not to go too deep. And then once we've got the tooth sectioned, we're going to use our elevator. And I like to use a 46R elevator, but you can use any elevator you want. A straight elevator will do well. And we're going to elevate out the distal half of the crown, followed by the mesial half of the crown. OK, now, so let's get to the surgery. We're going to give a mandibular nerve block in addition to a lingual nerve block and a long buckle. And then we're going to protect the airway with a 4x4 gauze so that uh, anything that breaks will not go down the patient's throat or into their airway. Uh, and it also absorbs the water from irrigation. We're going to start our incision with a disto buckle release and then carry that into the buccal sulcus to about the mid portion of the first molar. So our incision goes all the way down to bone through the periosteum, and we carry that into the buccal sulcus. And I like to start at the first molar and then go distally using just the tip of the, of the scalpel. And then once I've got, uh, I've incised all the way through the periosteum, I'm going to take my periosteal elevator. And uh, oral surgeons use the sharp end, not the round end. And I'm going to separate the mucoperiosteal flap from the bone. So this is going to be full thickness all the way down to bone. I'm going to go on top of the tooth uh, and release some tissue 
uh, over where the tooth is lying. And then I'm going to come in with a scissor. I'm going to cut out a little soft tissue triangular wedge that is uh, that functions to prevent uh, swelling or bleeding from filling up into the incision and increasing the amount of swelling and discomfort that the patient has. So we'll take that little wedge of tissue out. It also makes it ir easier for them to irrigate postoperatively. And we're going to take our handpiece and we are going to sweep away the bone that's on top of this tooth. And this is not um, <laughs> sped up. This is the actual speed. It's a very light pressure using a 702 or 703 burr until we see the crown uh, fully and we can see where the edge of it is. We're then going to take our burr and we're going to sweep away bone, on, create a trough on the buccal aspect, carry that a little bit distally and a little bit mesially, but not too far, and fully expose the crown as well as the buccal frication. Now we can create our split by going mesiodistally about two-thirds of the way of the, uh, of the crown and towards the frication. And now that we've got it split, we can come in with our, here's our 46R elevator, and I'm going to elevate and you can see that there's some bleeding uh, that's going on here now. I'm going to remove the distal half of the crown and then I'm going to uh, very quickly as my assistant holds the suction uh, right there in the socket, I'm going to remove the mesial portion of the crown. And that comes out and then I'm going to grab it with a uh, Kelly hemostat and before we deal with the bleeding proper, uh, once the tooth is out, we're going to take our curette, our angled curette, and we're going to clean out all the inflammatory tissue, any, any uh, granulation tissue, and the follicle, because those can all contribute to bleeding also. And we grab that with a mosquito hemostat that we use specifically for uh, grabbing soft tissue as opposed to uh, bony or hard tissue. And so now that we've got the follicle out, any granulation tissue, we're going to explore the wound. And you can see right here uh, where the bleeding is coming from. There's a small venule uh, that was passing through the socket. For packing the socket, we use our standard technique, which is to take a two by two gauze at the end of a hemostat and use that and force the gauze completely into the socket. So you wanna get the whole two by two gauze into the socket. And you can see that there's still a fair amount of bleeding despite putting the gauze in there. So we're going to wait. We're going to leave the pack there for at least five minutes. So in this case, I'm going to go and remove tooth number 16, and that'll give us some time. And then we'll come back and check and see uh, if our bleeding has subsided. So we're going to take the gauze pack out slowly. And that's because we don't want to reinitiate bleeding. And we see that there is a little more little soft tissue that we missed. So we're going to take that out. And then once we've exposed the site again, we see that we still have a fair amount of bleeding. So we're always thinking ahead to the next steps, which is going to be our closure, hopefully soon. So we're going to take our bone file and smooth off the bone edges while the suction is kept close, thoroughly irrigate, and then once we get the bleeding under control, we'll be ready to close our wound. I'm going to place a square of surgicel deep into the wound, and then I'm going to put a 2x2 uh, two two pack on top of that, and we're going to go over, once we've got this gauze completely packed in there, we're going to go over and do the right side, teeth numbers 1 and 32, and we're going to come back about 10 minutes later, and we see that uh, the bleeding has slowed down a bit and so we're going to then again slowly take out our gauze pack just pull it out slowly with a hemostat be prepared to repack it right away and we can see that the bleeding has slowed down but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put some more gel foam in there but it's going to be wrapped in Surgicel and uh, that gives it a little bit more body and makes it a little bit more hemostatic and then we are going to put our 2x2 two two again on top of that and pack all that down to the inferior portion of the socket where the bleeding is coming from. So we're going to get that whole 2x2 two two gauze or as much as we can into the hole and with the gauze in place, we're going to do our closure and just a single interrupted suture between the first and second molars and the, uh, to hold the interdental papilla in place is all you really need. Uh, you can put one more distally, um, but uh, you don't always have to. So I'm going to tie my three throws, cut the knot, and then we're going to go back to look at number 17 area. And as we slowly take out the gauze, 
we see that the bleeding for the most part is pretty much controlled. There's not a whole lot of bleeding anymore. Now in this case I am going to add another suture distal to the second molar and that's basically to hold the packing in place. So we're going to again take our 3-0 gut suture and pass it from buccal to lingual. Not too far on the lingual because we don't want to come close to the lingual nerve. And we're going to bring the tissue loosely together. You don't want to get it watertight because again if the patient has bleeding um, that's going to swell up uh, significantly into the wound and what you really want is for the any bleeding to drain outwards uh, and that keeps the patient again more comfortable. And finally as we did on the other side we're going to place some uh, 4x4 gauze uh, over the extraction site between number 16 and 17. Have the bite, patient bite down with firm pressure and what I recommend is uh, if you did this under local to keep them around for at least 15 minutes and that's to be sure that the bleeding has pretty much slowed down or stopped before you release the patient from your office. Her post-op instructions are basically uh, the routine post-op instructions that we give to all patients, and that is to use ice packs over the area or areas of surgery, about 20 minutes on and off, for the first 24 hours, or at least for the first day. And then for uh, pain control, what works really well is a combination of 400 milligrams of ibuprofen with 1,000 milligrams of acetaminophen, and that's actually been demonstrated in multiple orthopedic and emergency medicine articles uh, and studies that it is as effective uh, as uh, hydrocodone compounds with acetaminophen without all the side effects and the risk of opioid addiction. Um, as a backup to that, I always prescribe tramadol 50 milligrams and have them take one or two uh, in addition to the, uh, the ibuprofen and Tylenol uh, if they have breakthrough pain. They're told not to rinse on the day of surgery, but to continue the chlorhexidine rinses as well as warm saltwater rinses the following morning. And at follow-up uh, one week later, uh, she was actually doing pretty well. She had a little more swelling on the left side than on the right, which you would expect, uh, but otherwise did really well, no paresthesia. And uh, she was given a syringe to help flush out the sockets and um, uh, sent home. And that was... Uh, that was the end of this case. So I hope you learned something new from this video, or at least it reinforced what you already knew about how to manage bleeding from an extraction socket. This is just as applicable as uh, during, during the procedure as it would be if a patient comes in for a post-op bleed. It's pressure, pressure, pressure that does the trick, and of course you have to do it sometimes over and over again to get the bleeding to stop, but as they say, all bleeding eventually stops. I uh, hope you enjoyed this video and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.